Greetings of Peace, and welcome to this first public event of Faith in the Story, designed as a series of workshops between faith practitioners, media professionals, and academic scholars to change the conversation about religion. I'm Mahan Mirza, Executive Director of the Ansari Institute in the Keough School of Global Affairs at the University of Notre Dame. Let me offer a quick introductory word before turning it over to Professor Alex Shu to frame today's event and introduce our distinguished panel. Inaugurated in 2018, the Rafat and Zorin Ansari Institute for Global Engagement with Religion is dedicated to studying, learning from, and collaborating with religious communities worldwide. Upon our inauguration, we inherited an ongoing conversation at Notre Dame to enhance religious literacy in the public sphere. In October 2019, we organized a major conference titled Religion Beyond Memes in partnership with the Contending Modernities Research Initiative at the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies. You can access the conference at ansari.nd.edu. One of the things we were reminded of in that conference was that complexity, which is the bread and butter for academics, is not always helpful for the non-specialist. Generalization, which involves abstraction, is no less than intellectual skill, essential for accessible and informative journalism. We also asked the question about what gets published are stories about religion or faith communities supposed to provide some kind of universal or general literacy? Or are they supposed to capture current events in any given news cycle? The weirder and crazier, the better. Do the choices of what gets airtime reflect the idiosyncratic interests of, of whoever might happen to be on the religion beat or inadvertently advance the agendas of networks of powerful influencers? In that conference, we were also reminded that faith practitioners, both leaders of traditions and institutions, as well as everyday believers, must be given more chances to speak for themselves instead of just being spoken for. As such, this series, which aims to build on our previous conversations, is designed in the form of trialogues between journalists, academics, and practitioners. Between now and 2023, the series has planned three multi-day workshops around each of which will be a public event, culminating in a summative conference among the workshop participants to consolidate our experiences and findings. We express our deepest gratitude for placing their trust in the Ansari Institute by supporting this series to the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. And now let me turn it over to Professor Alex Xu, an expert in early Buddhist scriptures in medieval China, as well as in contemporary religion and global affairs. Alex is the lead faculty implementing this project of faith in the story. Alex, take it away. Hi, Mahan. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Faith in the story, as Mahan alluded to, and you can read more about at our website, is conceived around the notion of a three-way dialogue, a trialogue. Our idea here was to bring together experts from three different professional worlds, academia, journalism, and faith, to speak from the places and with the powers they inhabit best and about the problems they know best, and to learn to speak to, with, and for each other instead of simply over each other. It's a project we think we can start small scale. Each trilogue will bring together just five journalists, five faith leaders, and five academics to hash out what they can each contribute to a conversation about religion and what we can contribute together. So the title of the project, Faith in the Story, means two things at once. Journalists and academics and faith leaders all doggedly pursue their stories through thick and thin, sometimes at great personal cost but it also refers to the ways in which we feel the absence of complex, nuanced discussion of religious matters in the public sphere. When faith is the story, it is often superficially covered. We are concerned to keep it in the story. 
The first trialogue in our series, Hindsight is 2020, was meant to take place right now in person at Notre Dame after it had already been postponed multiple times due to the coronavirus pandemic. We decided to postpone the trialogue again to the end of the year and hold this public way station virtual event to keep the year 2020 in our minds with the benefit of six months of hindsight. Our guests tonight were originally signed on to kick off our in-person trialogue, and we decided we should meet beforehand and do this public panel. A smaller group of selected trialoggers will be meeting tomorrow to introduce ourselves and plan our in-person meeting in the winter. I want to reread our panel description to give everybody a sense of what hindsight is 2020 is after the theme of our first trialogue with our eyes on the United States. Our further two trialogues plan to be more global in scope. In the United States, 2020 was marked by a mismanaged response to a global pandemic, a nationwide uprising against racist police brutality, and an electoral referendum on Donald Trump and his style of partisan politics. The year's events prompted Americans to tell new stories about who we are in relation to each other and the rest of the world. Yet in American popular imagination, religion continues to play similar roles. Quote, bad religion destroys individual freedoms and blocks social progress, while quote, good religion repairs damage to the social fabric or sustains the struggle. Are we continuing to tell the same old story about religion in American life? If so, Whose stories are we ignoring and which stories are we forgetting? So this June, we mark six full months into 2021, six months of a new presidential administration, reckonings for racial injustice, and the unpredictably evolving post-coronavirus reality. Six more months of hindsight with which to clock what even happened that year, and also for evaluating how the events of 2020 have continued to produce after effects in both the new cycle and everyday life. So was faith in the story we told, in the stories we told about 2020, or was it missing? Six months later, our nuanced portraits of how faith informs our shared social life together still missing in action? What lessons can we draw from how religion in the United States captured the journalistic imagination over 2020? Our speakers will reflect on the stories we got right, the stories we got wrong, the stories that we missed, and the stories that are still happening today. So today joining us are Olivia Wilkinson, Director of Research at the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, here to discuss religious responses to COVID at a global scale. Simranjit Singh, columnist at Religion News Service, scholar, faith activist, and journalist, here to tell us about the intersections of race and religion in 2020. And Alan Cooperman, the Director of Religion Research at Pew, here to tell us about the stories of faith and political polarization of 2020. They will speak for around 10 minutes each, and then the four of us will convene for a roundtable conversation for another 20 minutes. In the final 30 minutes or so, we'll open to Q&A from all of you, whom we're delighted to hear from. Um, so with that, um, I'll turn it over to Olivia to kick us off. Thanks, Alex. Um, yes, hello everyone. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation today to speak. So my topic is religion and COVID-19. Um, as I've already been introduced, I'm the Director of Research at the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities, which is an international collaboration on evidence and research on the roles of religions in international development. Um, so in preparation for this talk, I was thinking back to January and February 2020, um, and thinking how, I don't know how many of you did this as well, I started to make a library to keep track of everything I saw that mentioned religion in relation to COVID-19. And there was quite a lot, more than I expe uh, expected, in fact. From the very beginning of the pandemic, we have heard about the effects of COVID-19 and associated restrictions on religious communities. Uh, the stories at the beginning were the super spreader events and related shutdowns of religious gatherings. That seemed to be the first reporting trend. Purim was one of the earliest events disrupted for many congregations this year. It then soon became clear from the uh, Shinjong Shi church in Korea through to the Tablighi Jamaat events in India 
that religious gatherings posed a risk for the spread of the virus, but also grabbed media headlines as super spreader events. So I was collecting this library, uh, you know, just saving stories that I'd seen um, online on my own for myself. But I started talking with some other colleagues and I think that almost any scholar researcher interested in religions um, in the contemporary world um, at the beginning of uh, the pandemic was also doing something slightly similar to what I was doing, which collecting all these stories. Um, but the colleague I happened to be talking to, particularly at the time, uh, was Catherine Marshall from the Berkeley Center in Georgetown. And we gathered together on the 11th of March, 2020, um, uh, some people were still in person actually at the Berkeley Center, which shows, uh, I think it was the day before everything closed down. Um, but anyway, we started uh, after that meeting to gather a faith and COVID-19 repository of resources, of stories, of anything that we could find um, that was reporting somehow on um, religious links to responses to COVID-19. That's still available online. We're still running it. We're still adding things every week. Uh, we don't really have an end date. It's just a running uh, uh, project that we have now. And we're going to put it on a better web platform soon as well so that it will be searchable into the long term and an accessible repository of stories on religious responses to COVID-19. But uh, having done this project, I can reflect a little bit on some of the trends that we've seen in the reporting. So as I said, I was fascinated to see so much reporting. Well, not so much, but more than I expected um, on religions in the initial weeks and months of the pandemic. I was not particularly used to seeing religion as such an interest area in health crises and global health international development that I look into uh, on a daily basis. So the very fact that there had been you know, seemingly kind of a glut of articles on religious response to the pandemic um, and articles in humanitarian and develop, development specific media outlets that I look at was, was feeling notable. But I was also equally very cautious to see how religion's roles would be reported, uh, noting that religious literacy uh, in reporting had, you know, can be weak. Uh, with notable exceptions, of course. Um, so considering that these two areas that I started, that I was looking at humanitarian and development world, and then also reporting journalism, um, that there's a history of kind of a weak uh, understanding of religious literacy, I was feeling a little bit nervous and also had started to see some stories that made me a little bit nervous about the way that uh, uh, um, religion was being reported on. And one of the reasons why we were not expecting to see a lot of reporting was because this has been a gap um, in public health emergency responses, most notably in the Ebola response uh, in West Africa in 2014 to 2015, where religious and community leaders were not initially engaged. There was not any reporting about the potential roles of religions in, um, in, in uh, responding to Ebola, in, in playing a role at all, really. But then after about six months, um, there was an obvious gap um, and a need to engage with religious leaders, in particular around burial procedures, um, because it was becoming clear that um, burial was a time of High, uh, higher probability of, of spreading Ebola. So there was an engagement after about six months um, that has since been called a game-changing role. And after that point, there was a lot more reporting and research on the role of religious leaders um, in, in that public health emergency. And so interestingly, after Ebola, I think that um, Certainly in development global health, some people have kind of got the memo, got the memo that it's interesting to uh, report on the roles of religious leaders um, and uh, their particular positions to play um, in, in a health response. But, you know, it was still limited in some ways. So after the rush to describe super spreader events, there was another peak of interest in how religious festivals were going to be affected, notably with Passover, Easter, Ramadan in quick succession um, and effects on major pilgrimages such as the Hajj. We saw 
the good news type stories about religions responding to COVID-19 with food kitchens and well, all types of assistance really. And then we saw the kind of um, um, uh, a real interest in the ways in which religious worship was being translated to online fora. Um, that piqued a lot of people's interest. But then we also saw the kind of bad news stories, um, the, the um, instances in which religious leaders and communities went against COVID restrictions to continue to gather. So we're starting to get this duality between the, the good, you know, what ha religion in this box of the good, and then uh, the bad. And this is, this is a problem that we'll probably come back to again and again, this kind of categorization that really isn't giving the, good, the full picture. Um, many of these themes have also remained relevant. We saw stories again around religious festivals when they repeated for their second COVID year this year. Um, reporting on super spreader events has continued too. For example, um, in India, you may have heard about the Kumbh Mela, um, sometimes called one of the world's biggest religious gatherings in northern India, um, that was a super spreader event for the, the now called Delta variant. Um, the difference between last year and now, however, um, is the rise of reporting on religious takes on the vaccine, which, you know, is just a natural evolution as we've, uh, the vaccine has become available, of course, there's, there's more reporting. Um, but um, there's also been more interest in reporting on information and misinformation spread amongst religious uh, communities. Now, that was also reported on last year, but there's particular interest around the vaccine um, and the idea that there will be religiously rooted conspiracy theories spreading about the vaccine. And of course, there are some examples of that. But I think even from previous research and reporting on um, religions and vaccines, we know that it's hardly ever religiously rooted alone. It's always enmeshed in other social, cultural, political, economic, etc. factors. This is not new to COVID, but we are still seeing some of this um, slightly, uh, um, again, very um, categorized, boxed off reporting about the way that um, religions are um, interpreting and understanding uh, vaccines. Um, so the threat here overall is, of course, oversimplification, putting religious into the good and bad religion boxes, not understanding, as with the very basic principles of religious literacy, that these stories and examples are based in religious communities that are diverse, dynamic, constantly changing, contextually specific. Um, and there are also thousands, thousands of stories, I'm sure, that we have missed of these everyday examples of religions responding to COVID-19. Uh, to pick a trend that I think we've missed, I think perhaps overall reporting um, has missed um, the amount of spiritual support, pastoral care, counseling that went on within religious communities between peers from religious leaders. It's not been missed completely, but I think that maybe it's been um, not as um, not as a hot topic as the super spreader events, et cetera, um, and the very tangible types of assistance that can be seen, um, such as the food kitchens and, and others. Um, it's not something that we've seen in the reporting, but I know when I you know, talk to faith-based organizations that we work with a lot, that's something that is an absolute priority and is talked about a lot. Um, I think overall, just to sum up now, um, the emergency mindset in the pandemic, this need for, need for speed of stories to have the hot topics, the trends, just lends itself to a superficiality, an oversimplification. Um, this topic, the very topic of uh, religious responses to COVID-19, will be researched for years to come. Um, so we must remember that we only have the beginning of many of these stories, the surface of many of these stories, their initial glimpses into the complex, very complex webs beneath the surface. Um, so I am looking forward to that depth emerging more consistently um, over time. And um, I hope that um, our repository of stories will be able to be searched and researched by people looking back over these first, uh, the first year and a half now um, of the pandemic to see how 
we were reporting on religion and COVID-19 at the time. Uh, so I think that's my, maybe over my 10 minutes, but I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Thank you, Olivia. That sounds like a terrific research uh, resource for, for researchers and for other journalists thinking about where to, where to pick up the story and how to do an audit of the kind of stories that, that we did create. Um, Dr. Singh. Sure, thank you, and, and good to be with you all, um, and, and to spend some time reflecting on a topic that I care about uh, very passionately, uh, religion news and, and media coverage. Um, as, as you all already know, I'm a, I'm a scholar of religion. Uh, I'm a former board member and current active member with the Religion News Association. If you're not familiar, uh, it's a good group of people. Um, and in addition to being a regular columnist with Religion News Service, uh, I contribute regularly to other outlets, including Time and CNN and, and the Washington Post. And I'm, I'm tasked here today to reflect on religion stories, uh, academics and the media got right, got wrong, or even missed completely in 2020. And, and the thing is, there is so much that one could say on these topics. Uh, religion was a hot beat in 2020. Uh, it was an eventful year, to say the least. Uh, a global pandemic, uh, global protests around racial justice, uh, and a US presidential election like no other. And so there's, there's so much we could talk about, so much we could cover, and trying to do all of it would just leave us all walking away feeling unsatisfied. And so instead of trying to do everything, I'll try and focus here on how race, religion, and politics have come together over the past year uh, in, our, in our popular understandings and in the way that we've discussed them, uh, especially with respect to the widespread protests that emerged after the police killing of George Floyd. So I'll, I'll explore a few touch points. And as I do so, I'll share a few stories that I worked on uh, that helped me bring forward some of the cracks, not just uh, to the public consciousness, but also to my own. Um, and also not just in news coverage, but also in public discussions on these topics too. Um, and, and I say this because much of my work aims to raise up those on the margins. Uh, this is my ethos as a Sikh. It informs the stories that I seek to tell uh, and the communities that I aim to represent. And, and you know, the, the, the other thing I want to forefront here is that there's been no other time in my life where this intersection has felt so urgent. Race, religion, and politics. Right on the one hand, this is this is my this is what I live for, uh, and I'm, it, it excites me. But for the most part, and for most of my career, I hasn't really gotten the attention of the people around me. Uh, you know, my friends, my neighbors, they'll they'll sort of glance at it. My wife, uh, she, she typically wouldn't even even read anything I wrote. Uh, but now people are recognizing that these stories are urgent uh, because people are dying. Uh, because things are deteriorating, that hate and bigotry uh, is not just on the rise, but that it has risen to extreme power. And I think as, as we were hearing from Olivia, as, as with the pandemic, the severity of the inequities, as well as our close attention to what's going on around us for once, uh, has helped us see what has long been true, but that we have overlooked. Racism and religion are close cousins. And through, through Trump and his close friends, uh, we have better seen the nexus between white nationalism, white supremacy, and Christian evangelicalism. And, and some of you may have been surprised to see this. Some of you may have expected it. But no matter our expectations, we all saw the connection. And not just those of us who spend our lives studying it, people around us who typically aren't paying attention saw this connection. And I would say on the whole, uh, the media, I think the reporting has done, has done a pretty solid job of exploring this relationship of showing us that white nationalism is not just about white supremacy. It's a movement that goes beyond that. And it's one that has religion as, as a driving factor, right? There, there's been incredible attention on conservative religion and its role in this, in this process. And I'd also say while there's no religious core to white, ra ra white nationalism, its anti-religious tone uh, is one of its unifying themes, 
And one thing we didn't see much of, or at least in my opinion, not enough of, is reporters covering and helping people understand how anti-religious sentiment is core to how white nationalism operates, right? Scholars, scholars believe that of all their principles, uh, anti-Semitism is the most connective force for white nationalism. And the fact that most people don't know this and then ask why, wonder why anti-Semitic hate is surging, it speaks to how critical it is that we understand this perspective and how we're not doing a good enough job of, of bringing this forward. I think news coverage this year, as well as national discourse, uh, for me, has revealed that Americans don't know the history of racism, nor do they know how it connects with religion. And this, this ignorance, whether it is intentional, manipulated, or, or, whether it's, or whether it's unintentional, it's created a significant obstacle for us. So this is, this is the second point that I want to get to, because without understanding how racism works and its historical development, how can we begin to address it? You know, last, last July, Donald Trump stoked racial tensions when he held an Independence Day rally in South Dakota. And Native leaders, Native American leaders, called for Trump to cancel the rally. And more than a dozen Indigenous activists and allies were arrested for blocking a highway leading to the event. And as I watched this happening, I wasn't sure why. I didn't, I didn't actually understand. And, and among the activists was Nick Tilson, who is the president of the NDN Collective, a citizen of the Ogala Lakota Nation. And, and I started reading what he was writing. And one of the things I learned, he wrote, um, as he was explaining the religious significance of Mount Rushmore for native communities, he wrote that more than 50 different indigenous nations actually have origin stories or ties or spiritual connections to the Black Hills. And that US law has recognized the Lakota nation as the rightful caretakers of that land. Now, this may seem like a strange perspective to you. And until Trump's appearance, I, uh, like many of you probably, considered Mount Rushmore as nothing other than a symbol of American patriotism, right? That's what I had learned growing up. But as I learned about this petition and the historical significance of Mount Rushmore to the Native communities, something clicked in my mind. This was just another example of how American racism works. American colonialism, racist abuse continues to have an impact on us today. And as it's happening, we don't even see it happening. We don't even know it's happening. We don't know why it's happening. Even those among us who are scholars of religion and race. So these are, these are real issues, right? If we don't know this, then how do we expect other people to know this? If this isn't part of our uh, public consciousness and our school curriculum, then how do we expect our kids to know this information? I, I wanna share very briefly that I, I had remembered as, as I was reading about this, this tension in South Dakota, I, I had remembered uh, learning about the doctrine of discovery earlier, uh, a few years earlier, and I, and I went back to learn, learn more. And, and here's what I found, that on May 4th, 1493, just after Christopher Columbus arrived in the New World, uh, Pope Alexander VI issued the papal bull, uh, Inter Caetera, which announced that any land not inhabited by Christians was open to be discovered by Christian rulers, and that, and here's the quote, the Catholic faith and Christian religion be exalted and be everywhere increased and spread, that the health of souls be cared for and that the barbarous nations be overthrown and brought to faith itself. Now this document would come to be known as the doctrine of discovery. It was foundational to European colonization of the Americas uh, and their presumptive claims of Western expansion, uh, which we would come to call manifest destiny. So now knowing this, we have to ask ourselves a new question, right? Before I might've asked, what does religion have to do with American racism? And now attending to its conquest and colonization, I have to ask a different question. Is it even possible to decouple religion from American racism? And I think this, this historical study of racism and its relationship to religion is something that is not touched upon. I haven't seen it uh, anywhere uh, within within media coverage, and and to not know this, uh, to not have this as part of the narrative, is is to fail, right? That this is the problem. This is this is what's at stake. 
I think what we see here also through the doctrine of discovery, it's a helpful example of seeing how racist ideas of supremacy over indigenous peoples included religious authorities whose own biases were not only used to justify, but to sanctify the seizure of occupied lands, the physical removal of communities to undesirable reservations and systemic violence of genocidal proportions. Now, I, I don't want to dwell on this too much, and so, so I'll move along because I, I know that you all get this, um, given where you're coming from, um, and, and you can see how valuable and critical it is for this to become part of our narratives, but I would say the same is true for how anti-Blackness works in this country. Uh, we are people of the moment. Uh, we think Jim Crow was so far along ago that, that we don't even discuss it anymore. Um, we might talk about the new Jim Crow, we might talk about police brutality, but we fail to make the connections uh, between then and now and how these things have come together. So, so the point here for me is that this is the history, but it's also the present. It's just underneath the surface of our popular understandings and the coverage doesn't go far enough uh, to shed light on how these issues are connected and therefore everyday Americans remain ignorant uh, to how religion and race have conspired together to create ugliness for centuries and today. There, there, there are two other things that I want to say, and I'll do them very quickly. One is uh, another linkage that tends to go unexplored, and, and, and I think you know this idea of supremacy is, is a theme that I want to continue on. Uh, we are starting to talk more about white supremacy. We are starting to talk some about the relationship between religion and race. Uh, we're not talking about religious supremacy, and I think that's a direction we're going to go in in the next 10 years. Um, religious supremacy, very simply, is, is the belief that uh, my way of living, my way of viewing the world is better than yours, and therefore I deserve more than you, right? It's, it's a different kind of supremacy, but it's supremacy all the same. Uh, it's incredibly common. Uh, it's also incredibly dangerous. It creates and justifies supremacist mindsets. Uh, and we've seen the kind of damage it has wrought. And I, I tried to write about this in one of my columns this past year to help open up the dialogue, the conversation around religious supremacy. Uh, and many people felt challenged by it. Uh, many people felt affirmed by it. Uh, but I think what was common uh, in the feedback that I received, at least, is that it's something that uh, intrigued people because it's not a conversation that they had really considered before. Um, so I, I believe that as we work to challenge and dismantle white supremacy, uh, the views of religious supremacy uh, and Christian normativity and Christocentrism won't be far behind. And, and the last point that I just wanted to make very briefly is that once we begin to grapple with religious supremacy, uh, and religious normativity, uh, we'll be able to better recognize how American news media tends to privilege certain groups and to overlook minoritized religious communities in this country. Uh, and this won't be a surprise to those of you who belong to minoritized communities because uh, you live this and you feel it anecdotally. Uh, and it also won't be a surprise to those who are familiar with how cognitive bias works because we overlook those who are less familiar. And I'll just share that one of the most uh, compelling and fun stories I worked in, uh, worked on in 2020, um, was around uh, the the rise of the religious left. But I didn't do it in the way uh, that many others did, which is because they, they there was so much focus on on Christian progressive efforts, which were fantastic and beautiful to watch. Um, but no one was talking, or very few people, very few reporters were talking about. Uh, progressives and uh, faith leaders from, from minority groups. Uh, and so one of, one of the stories that I loved writing on uh, was the, the Muslim voter turnout in, in Michigan, uh, which helped swing the election, the presidential election. Um, 80,000, an estimated 80,000 Muslim Americans uh, voted by a mail-in ballot alone. Uh, in 2016, Hillary Clinton lost to Donald Trump in Michigan by 11,000 votes. And this election, Joe Biden took Michigan handily, gaining nearly 150,000 more votes than Trump. So it was a, it was a significant uh, shift. We believe that uh, there were about twice as many Muslim voters in Michigan this year as, as the last election. 
Um, and it's, it's a story that goes untold, but it, but it has significant consequences, both in terms of where a community is headed, uh, where it's going, uh, and that's a major narrative, but also in the moment uh, for the entire country, uh, this had significant uh, consequences. So, so that's, that's a story that I loved working on um, and, and one that I think is the kind of story that is often overlooked. Um, and, 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 you know, um, overall, I would say that religion reporters are doing an incredible job balancing and addressing the firestorm of news over the past years, and especially in 2020. Uh, and yet, I think expanding our understanding of our own biases will lead us to richer coverage that's not just more diverse and representative, but that also gives us a deeper understanding of what's beneath the surface uh, and what we can do to grow together. So, thank you. Thank you, Simran. Uh, I learned so much just from your 15, 10 minutes. Um, and I'm excited to, to dig in and, and learn some more. Um, Alan, why don't you take us to the end? Hi. Uh, well. Thank you so much for having me. And I really enjoyed listening to uh, what Olivia and Simran had to say. And I do have some comments, I think, at some point on what they had to say, and maybe we'll get to that in the next part. But I had been asked in preparation to talk about the role of religion in the highly polarized 2020 presidential election uh, with a particular eye to uh, the reality of, of uh, religion's role and media coverage of it. And I guess, um, Simran, um, I think the media had a tough time in 2020 um, and religion reports, I think it was a hard year actually for religion reporters and uh, for just the opposite reason in a funny way, because I don't think much really happened uh, on the religion and politics beat. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. In preparation for this, I went back and I looked uh, at a lot of clips. Um, I had kept a bit of a clip file. I, I won't claim that I did a, anything like a really thorough study of media coverage of religion in the campaign, but it is something I pay attention to. And there were a lot of stories during the course of the campaign and then even after the election. And uh, stories that caught my eye were stories about younger white evangelical Protestants turning democratic. Uh, about black voters, especially uh, young black men uh, turning Republican, uh, about uh, Catholics turning away from Joe Biden, and about Jews turning toward Donald Trump. And I don't think any of those things actually happened. Uh, the only way you could really argue those things happened is if you cherry pick the comparison date. So just to take one example, uh, the Obama elections brought out uh, African-American voters uh, like no previous American elections. Uh, maybe for the first time in American history, uh, African-Americans voted in proportion to their share of the overall population, which is an extraordinary thing. Um, and uh, not surprising then, um, very likely that since the Obama election, uh, black turnout, including of younger black men declined somewhat. Uh, but I think it would be really um, a, a misstatement to argue that young black men turned in any significant numbers toward uh, Donald Trump. In fact, they overwhelmingly, those who voted, overwhelmingly voted Democratic. And in fact, the overall um, picture of religion's role in politics in the 2020 campaign is, is one of continuity, not of change. All those stories that I mentioned, those sort of headline uh, findings, um, they're kind of man bites dog stories. They're exciting stories because they would be about change. And the reason it was a hard year <laughs> is that not much changed actually. Um, the, the, the contours of religion's role in American politics did not fundamentally change. Uh, in the Trump years and did not fundamentally change uh, from 2012 to 2016 to 2020, or you could look at the midterm to midterm. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what I, what I mean by that. Um, there's actually a lot of balance in this, in this uh, picture of religion's role in American politics. Uh, the balance that I see in particular is between two very large, important religious constituencies and their voting patterns. Uh, one of those constituencies is white evangelical Protestants. Everybody knows white evangelical Protestants consistently vote Republican by a margin of something close to four to one, uh, about 80%. And they have 
in all the recent elections. Now, it's not true going all the way back to Jimmy Carter, of course, when they voted Democratic, but so I'm not saying these things never change, but they haven't changed in recent elections. And the talk that uh, evangelicals were going to turn against Trump for some reason or another didn't happen. They turned out for Trump and they voted for Trump. Uh, at rates in 2020, very similar to in 2016. In fact, um, white evangelical Protestants made up about one third of Republican voters uh, in both 2016 and in 2020. Um, they make up a slightly lower share than that, uh, something around a fifth of all voters. So that partly uh, uh, that, that mathematics happens when you get eight and 10 of them voting one way. Um, now, uh, the other balance, uh, balancing group is the religiously unaffiliated, and it's a big group, just like white evangelicals. There's a lot of um, differences among white evangelicals. They're not a completely uh, monolithic group, and the same is true of religiously unaffiliated people, or sometimes called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, atheists, agnostics, people who uh, sort of don't identify with any organized religious group. And as everybody knows, many of them do have some religious beliefs and practices. They're not a completely non-religious group, but they don't identify with any religion. And they vote overwhelmingly Democratic. And they did in, in 2012, they did in 2016, they did in 2020. Now they don't, they're a younger group and they don't actually turn out in proportion to their share of the population. They actually kind of uh, under punch politically. But uh, interestingly, they made up about a third of Democratic voters in 2016 and about a third in 2020. So again, white evangelicals making up a third of Republican voters, the unaffiliated making up about a third of Democratic voters in both elections, really actually not a lot of change going on there. And the other groups that one might think about, um, African-American Protestants voted overwhelmingly Democratic as they have in recent elections. Jews voted overwhelmingly Democratic as they have in recent elections. Um, uh, one of the big narratives, uh, and um, and Simran alluded to it in this uh, in this uh, campaign, was the narrative of Christian nationalism, uh, and uh, there was a there was a good uh, summation of it after the election, actually, in a May 2021 New Yorker article, uh, described uh, Christian nationalism as a set of beliefs that quote center on the idea that God intended America to be a Christian nation and which, when mingled with conspiracy theory and white nationalism, helped to fuel the insurrection, uh, close quote, at, at the insurrection that uh, took place at the Capitol uh, on January 6th. And that same article quotes Andrew Whitehead, who's a leading scholar of this, and he and, uh, and Sam Perry, uh, who are colleagues and, and friends of, of, of ours at Pew Research Center. Um, uh, they don't work at Pew, but, but, but they're uh, very good scholars. They wrote a book about this, and Andrew was quoted in the in the New Yorker piece as saying, "Quote: Violence has always been a part of Christian nationalism," and there was a ton written about Christian nationalism in this election. But um, you know, if you dig into the data on this, uh, what you find is that. Um, the measures of Christian nationalism are, are based on polling questions and people and, and the ones that Perry and Whitehead used ask questions like this. Uh, do you agree or disagree? Uh, quote, America's success is part of God's plan. And frankly, you get all kinds of religious people, white, black, brown, all varieties agreeing with that. Um, and it's not a white supremacist uh, notion. Uh, another is the federal government should allow prayer in public schools. And there you get a strongly majoritarian minoritarian split, uh, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with race or racial supremacy. Uh, and I guess the question I have, and, and it's really a genuine question, uh, I'm not making an assertion about it, but um, you know, I'm old enough to remember the moral majority in the 1980s, and I'm old enough to remember the books about the theocons during the uh, George uh, W. Bush administration in the 1990s, and I frankly don't understand what the argument is about what's new about Christian nationalism. That is, in what way are these people, the people who hold these views and are these views inherently different or new? Um, I haven't seen that in any of the literature. I didn't see it in any of the news articles. There's a kind of a new name for it, 
um, but I'm not actually seeing that there's anything inherently new about it. And I'm also not seeing any dissection of the fact, again, that there are lots of people who are not white who agree with many of these uh, sentiments other than the white supremacist ones. Uh, so in other words, another way of asking this question is, yes, there are Christians. Yes, there are nationalists. Is the Christian is Christianity inherently nationalist? Is nationalism inherently Christian? Or is there just a Venn diagram where there's some people who happen to be conservative nationalist Christians? I'm not, I, I'm not sure that I understand the argument that this is a new, fundamentally new nexus um, as, as it was portrayed in this election. Um, and uh, I think I'm about at time. Um, I could say something about COVID, um, which is that I think um, while when you see differences in polling at two different periods in time, uh, it's, it's almost impossible to prove that any one thing made the difference. Uh, it, 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 it looks to me when I look at the polling that took place in January of 2020 and in April of 2020 and in June of 2020 and in September of 2020, it looks to me like COVID moved the whole electorate. Um, and that includes all the religious groups. So uh, insofar as there was change in religion politics, uh, there are groups like um, uh, white Catholics uh, who um, went a little more democratic in this election than they have in previous elections. Maybe that's because Joe Biden was a candidate, but when I look at the polling and when that took place, it seems to me that that was a COVID shift. It seems to me that COVID moved the whole electorate about five percentage points. Um, and when I say COVID, I mean really the administration's response to the, to, the, to the COVID pandemic and widespread disillusionment with that response moved the electorate about five percentage points and it moved many religious groups about five percentage points as well, but it wasn't an inherently religious thing that happened. And when I think about COVID and religion, I think about two things, um, neither of which I, I, I thought what Olivia had to say about COVID was really very interesting about the emer emergency mindset that, um, that was created um, and coverage of it. But there were two things that she didn't mention that I'll just throw in. Uh, uh, one is that uh, many, many congregations shut down. Uh, most people favored, religious people favored the precautions that congregations put into effect, uh, limiting the number of people or, or shutting down entirely. Um, um, spacing, spacing, social distancing within congregations and so on. And many people began, many congregations began streaming their services online as everybody knows, and many people began watching them. And we have data on this from, from surveys in which we asked people about it. And uh, it's a gigantic share of the American populace that began watching or streaming um, uh, uh, religious services online for the first time. When I say gigantic, we're talking like something like in the neighborhood of 20%. To me, that's a really big new number. It's not 80% or something, but a, a, a lot of people who previously went to religious services in person began streaming them for the first time online during this uh, pandemic. Uh, most of them actually said they were pretty satisfied with the online religious experience. And uh, most said they do intend to go back to physical services at the same rate they used to afterward. But still, it's very interesting. To, it'll be very interesting to see whether uh, the online religious experience is given a major boost by this. Just, just kind of like all of us began working from home and now many of us are starting to filter back into offices, but there's a sense that, um, that it'll never be quite the same. We're gonna be working more remotely than we, than we did in the past. And I think there's an, an interesting hypothesis that uh, religion, that this crisis, uh, this pandemic gave online religion a big boost. Um, uh, might've happened eventually anyway, but it, but it was jump-started. Uh, and the other interesting thing about COVID is the question of whether uh, by effectively making us all think about death and fear uh, and uh, mortality and, uh, uh, and our loved ones and separating us and doing all, all the disruption that it brought, disruption, fear, and dread that it brought to our lives uh, may have been good for religion at, at a broad level and maybe even at a global level. 
Uh, if you um, follow theories about uh, um, religion and secularization around the world, you may be familiar with the existential insecurity theory um, propounded by uh, quite a few people. Um, and uh, the basic notion is that religion uh, thrives in societies uh, that are uh, under stress uh, and where people feel insecure, in, in existentially insecure, where they feel their very lives are at risk. Uh, and that religion tends to, so the theory goes, uh, diminish in, in importance to individuals and societies in places where life is calm, unchanging, with sort of general, broad, slow progress in things sort of like Western Europe, as an example, and, and strong social safety nets. If that's true, then the reasonable hypothesis could be that the COVID-19 pandemic globally uh, could give a spurt to religion. We, we did ask a bunch of questions about this, and I'd be glad to talk more about what we've found so far. Um, I, I don't think that there's uh, any proof out there of a, a global jump in religion as a result of the pandemic, but it's a very interesting thing for us all to be keeping an eye on. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thank you, Alan. Um, a lot of interesting data for us all to, to uh, mull over and, and think about what the implication for the stories we tell, tell are. And um, so I think I'll start this round table with a question directly for Alan. Uh, which is, if what you're saying is true and that there's no news, right? It's all olds, right? The same same story about religion and politics and polarization that we can tell about 2016 as we can about 2020 and maybe 2018 as well. Um, what what implications does that have for for scholars and, and for journalists and uh, consumers of of those of us on the first hand? And uh, the second question I had for you was. Um, you know, I think I'm especially attuned to when Pew religion shows up in my news feed. To what extent has Pew polls or other kind of polls become part of the news cycle as well? And does that lead to accusations that you too have become politicized and, and that, you know, people should not have as much faith in, in the Pew survey? Well, that's, those are uh, two great questions to start with the uh... Um, the first one, you know that uh, before I came to the Pew Research Center about a dozen years ago, I, I had been a reporter for 27 years uh, at small newspapers, at the Associated Press, uh, overseas for a bunch of years. I covered the collapse of the Soviet Union for the AP. I was a correspondent in the Middle East. Uh, I was a foreign editor at US News and World Report, and I was the national security editor at the Washington Post. And then for about five or six years, I covered religion for the Washington Post. So I spent uh, much more of my professional life as a journalist than as a pollster. And uh, part of what I'm trying to say is actually very sympathetic to journalists because inherently news is change. Uh, you know, writing a news story about something that's exactly the same as it was the day before, the year before, two years before, et cetera, and is kind of what people know and expect is, is a really hard thing to do. And so there's a natural desire among reporters and I, I don't, I'm not a media basher. I, I think it's a completely natural thing to do to try to look for what's changing. And some of these things were reasonable hypotheses and some of these changes may take place over time because I'm also not saying that there's no change over time in religion and politics. I'm actually just saying that 26, 2020 was not, was, not a, was not a political realignment year in terms of religion. Um, it didn't shift those religious groups as far as I can see them. And, it didn't, and you can look at it in a whole lot of different ways. I mean, you can look at regular churchgoers as a, and, and regular attenders or people who are registered higher in various degrees of, uh, of, of religiosity uh, as opposed to looking at particular faith traditions and so on. I just don't see any fundamental change that took place in 2020. Um, and again, I think the Christian nationals thing is really, really interesting, and I'm glad people are writing about it. I think there's a lot there potentially. I'm just not sure that there's anything there that's new. Again, I'm not denying that Christian nationalism is a real thing. I'm just saying, I think it might be the same thing just by a different name. Um, we had all these books on the theocons. I have a stack of books in the, from the 1990s about the rise of the theocons. They look a lot like the stack of the book, that's, or this much smaller stack of books that's starting to appear about Christian nationalists. 
Uh, okay, so and then polling. Well, uh, you know, I don't know. Um, Pew Research Center doesn't. We don't try to predict uh, elections, and we don't do uh, really any horse race polling. Um, and we're not out with polls uh, every week or anything close to it. I mean, we we put out a some kind of poll about once a month. Uh, religion polls less often than that. And we're pretty careful in the way we present them um, and also the way we write the questions and things to try to be balanced. So I don't, I think it would be hard to make a case that Pew polls seem to be shifting the electorate or designed to do that. Uh, um, I guess I, philosophically, I'm very much um, alert to the notion kind of like a, uh, um, you know, like a, a, a physics principle um, that you can't observe something without um, uh, without um, affecting it. And um, at some philosophical level, uh, it's certainly possible that polls could do that. But the other thing you're thinking about is that's probably not the people we're polling. That is, that's not the respondents, because that's a really small number of people as you think about it. Um, it's a few thousand people in a particular poll, and it's a, maybe a few a hundred thousand people over the course of a year or something like that. That's it's more that people reading about it, and then they're reading about what people think. So I I, I don't know. I'm not I uh, I I don't think we're really making maybe too bad, but I don't think we're making that much of a difference. That <laughs> you know maybe that's contrary to interest, that we should be making a bigger difference. We're, I don't think we probably are. Uh, polling in general, by the way, um, in 2020, you know, as in 2016, there were a lot of people who thought that they, they knew what the outcome of the election was gonna be in advance, especially in 2016. And, uh, and then they blamed the polls, um, you know, whereas actually in both of those elections, uh, the polls were pretty darn close to where the national electorate turned out. Um, and polls are not particularly good at, you know, uh, state level polling is much more difficult than national polling for all kinds of reasons. And, uh, and also the so-called likely model, voter models that polls need to use to predict not only what people think, like who they favor, but which of those people are actually going to turn out at the, that's really hard. So, um, there have been some pretty good postmortems. I can direct people to one or two on, uh, on our website. Uh, but I, uh, while I, I'm uh, willing to think that, there, uh, that we need to look very carefully at polling and think about what we can do better all the time, I actually don't think that uh, 2020 was any sort of a disaster for polls. Um, actually, the polls predicted the outcome pretty, you know, within a few percentage points which is pretty darn good. Simon, I'd love to hear from you about um, us making a difference um, or anything else that you want to respond to. And in Alan's talk, um, I, I don't actually see you two speaking. I, I think the comments can be put into conversation with each other pretty, pretty, uh, pretty smoothly, actually. The story of um, no news, or rather this is a continuation, is, is part of the deeper story that it seems like you want to draw attention to, right? And the longer... Uh, a longer story, a deeper story, um, a more historically based story. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and I, you know, I, I'm right there with with Alan and, and a lot of that. Um, in terms of in terms of both um, the way that we've seen political uh, engagement from religious groups, although although we've seen um, different narratives. Um, more excitement, uh, more engagement in, in, in communities that have been particularly affected uh, by uh, some of the, the sort of uh, bigotry that, that we've seen from the previous president. Um, and also, I think um, Alan's point on Christian nationalism is, is right on, right? It's not, it's not a new thing. Um, it's, you know, some of the mechanisms are a little bit different. I think that's interesting. Uh, some of the language and packaging is a little bit different. I think I think that's interesting, uh, but overall, it's not a new thing. And I, I think you know this is this is a constant challenge in journalism when you're when you're trying to tell a story. That's I mean one one of the common phrases we say is there's nothing new. There's nothing new under the sun, and that's something we say in scholarship, and it's something that that journalists say as well. And so I think 
I think what's interesting to me uh, as we're looking at 2020, the two big stories aside from the election, which, which Ellen spoke about extensively, uh, are the pandemic, um, which, which Olivia gave us some insight to in the racial justice protests. And I think those two um, experiences have felt uh, on, on a human level, on a personal level, have felt incredibly different than anything else I've experienced in my life. Um, and so there's this desire, I think, for me personally to try and not just unpack that for myself, but to try and understand out of my own curiosity, what is it about this moment? What's driving people? What's moving people? What's different? Um, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter protests, it was as much as I've heard people talk about being against racism, it was the first time that I saw people who weren't directly affected um, by racism, uh, showing up and putting their lives on the line. And, and I saw that person, I live here in New York City, I went to protests um, and, and I saw people there who I would not have expected to show up in the middle of a pandemic, uh, knowing that they could get infected, um, knowing that the, the NYPD was uh, kettling people uh, and, and arresting them. And so it was, it was really interesting to me. And so it's not something that I have, I had expected or or really had the framework to understand. And, and so to me, there, there's something really different about that. And of course the pandemic, and there's no denying that's, that's something different for all of us. And so the stories that emerge out of there are super interesting across the board. And, and to me, I guess what's, what, what I always look for in a good story is what is, what is the experience that not, that's not being brought uh, to people's attention right now? Um, and so that's that's where, of course, I have my own bias towards the the role of religion. But that's where, in the racial justice context, you know, everyone's talking about race suddenly, and and you know, even my my neighbors and my friends from growing up all you know are reaching out for the first time to ask for a recommendation for a book on racism. You know, everyone's you know the New York Times bestseller list is all about anti racism, and and yet there there are certain things that are not being lifted up in that context. And so what are those? And then how do we talk about those stories? And also what are people's um, experiences, right? That sort of featurey human interest kind of story is, is really uh, critical uh, in, in a moment like that. And, and the same is true for the pandemic. And, and I'll just say in a very similar sense, um, we see so many stories around um, around the usual suspects. Um, you know, most, most of the stories that, that we saw in the Times or otherwise around uh, faith communities stepping up to serve in that moment or uh, controversies around um, places of worship being shut down, et cetera. I mean, they were uh, very much uh, focused on Christianity, but there, there were some really interesting stories that were untold. Um, and, you know, I tried to grab a couple of them myself, but and a few others in, in the reporting world did as well. Uh, but those stories largely went untold and they continue to be untold right now. And I think that's that's a real shame. And it's something that I think uh, is something we we all need to be attentive to going forward. There, there seems to be this, the stories that the polls tell and tell really well. And sometimes those are the same old stories, but there are the stories that the polls miss and have that human interest. And that's why we're so grateful to to columnists like you and reporters like you. Um, I want to talk to Dr. Wilkinson next. And so we have polls, we have human interest. Um, I was curious about um, institutional view, the institutions that uh, you mentioned working with. Um, and this uh, problematic that you described uh, between religion being categorized as good or bad do the religious institutions that you work with only want good stories to be told about themselves with respect to their their uh, reaction to coronavirus? Like we learned from Ebola and we did even better this time, and they want that you know message sort of amplified. What, what a good job they did, so they can get you know um, more funding, more recognition, um, or are they open to you know a, a fuller accounting of, of mistakes that were made and um, the full complexity? of religion, right? Not just religion good, religion bad, but religion both. Okay, well, um, I think the first thing to say is that in that 
global health development space, it's very well known that all organizations, um, faith-based or otherwise, um, have a problem reporting on failure because so much is dependent on donor dollars. So I don't think that would be something that would be, um, we could say is particularly um, a religious experience. Um, but I mean, I think that what we do hear is that um, there's, um, you know, it's going back to that, I, that religious literacy idea of religious communities are diverse. And so in every place, it's the people in their own community that are annoyed at the other people and how they've been working or, you know, misrepresenting or um, um, somehow working against what they've wanted to put across. Um, so I've had many conversations with people um, in religious institutions, faith-based organizations, you know, however we, we name the different types of faith actors that could be involved, who are, yeah, very much expressing that they are completely aware of the um, whole range of the spectrum of positive to negative that has happened within their own community. And I just think it's people within those communities that know the negatives as much as anyone else outside them, of course. The reporting on that though is that the stories, the stories being told, um, I I would say, I guess I would caveat what I said earlier on with the fact that, you know, I was talking about all stories that we saw, not people who are religious, you know, journalists who know how to talk about um, religion, because I agree with what's been said by our other two speakers that, you know, there are those folks are really doing a good job. Um, but if we look at the broad, broad spectrum, I just don't think that there are many, that many stories that are genuinely interested in some of that complexity, like going to a faith-based organization and saying, what went wrong, what went right, let's really dig into it. I mean, we, I just don't, I don't see those stories arising. So I don't think there's really that um, lack of interest per se. Um, and then there's the other piece, which is that a lot of faith actors are working on advocacy themselves, right? So yes, they are wanting to put out specific stories. And some of those stories at the moment, particularly around vaccination, are, you know, religious leaders signing on to statements to say, we support um, vaccine equity, um, that various things. So there is a whole branch of religious organizing that's going towards telling specific stories as well. Um, that we can't discount. So I think we see a lot of that as well. Um, whether, you know, whether it's the religious, whether it's faith actors themselves feeding into the good bad categorization, I think we can observe that sometimes, which is that um, there is, I mean, I'm talking specifically again about this humanitarian and development field that I know, but there is this pressure to kind of live up to somewhat of a of maybe a secular standard. And so therefore organizations shape themselves to present um, what needs to be presented um, and work within narratives and discourses that are, you know, um, dominant or prevalent within a certain field. So I think sometimes, yes, there is this um, tendency to step into that good, good faith actor kind of role and that means that there might be a specific story told of, about that good faith actor. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to hear from the other um, speakers as well. And thank you, Alan, that, um, you know, I briefly mentioned the role of the online, the move to online worship as being one of the trends in reporting that we saw kind of across the board. Um, and that's very prevalent. Um, I think the other point about whether we, um, we have seen stories in, we have stories in our repository talking about whether there is this shift, you know, a, a, a loss of religion or a shift towards religion. And we, I've also seen that in study, um, in studies of religions and disasters around the world. And there's all, that question is immediately at the forefront of people's minds. I am yet to see in any situation really good quality evidence that says that really shows there has been a move in one way or another so I am a little bit skeptical about being able to find that um, I think it's worth asking the question of course but um, it's again it's just that it's just that complexity of people may lose a little bit of their 
um, you know, may have a, um, faith shaken, but then also have all the positives of being within their community, etc. So it's really hard to get that hard and fast decline or increase kind of final result. Can I jump in there, uh, Alexander? Um, because uh, I think it's a great point, Olivia. And in fact, uh, if you think about the COVID-19 as a kind of natural experiment, it's a very complicated one because of the different ways that governments reacted, all the different things that were going on. It's going to be very hard for anybody to prove that it moved the religious needle in a particular way and not something else. But there is one great um, episode in history uh, that uh, folks may not know about, and I'll just bring it to your attention. Uh, because it was, an, it was almost perfect natural experiment, so to speak. Uh, no ethics board would ever allow anybody to, to actually to do this as an experiment. But uh, the Christchurch earthquake in 2011 uh, was actually not one earthquake. It was a series of uh, earthquakes and aftershocks, about a thousand shocks, and it hit the South Island of uh, New Zealand really hard. Um, hundreds of people were killed. Uh, thousands of people were moved out of their homes. Homes. Um, basically, uh, you know, downtown Christchurch, about a third of it was, was wiped out. Uh, big buildings collapsed. Both of the cathedrals uh, were, were, were badly damaged and all that. And amazingly, it took place right in between two waves of a very high quality national survey, the New Zealand Attitudes and Values Survey. And the other thing that's kind of amazing is um, if you were setting up an experiment, you couldn't do it any more beautifully. There's a control group because the rest of New Zealand was not affected. The North Island wasn't affected and even a lot of the South Island wasn't affected. And if you look at these two surveys and the overall data, New Zealand was a place that was clearly in a kind of long time, long term period of secularization. That is the share of the population in New Zealand that was religious in a variety of ways was declining clearly throughout the country, slowly but but sort of steadily. And then you look at this moment in time, and there are two surveys, one on each side, and for about a year, a sizable number of people lived in an area where the ground was literally shaking under their feet on a kind of daily basis, and guess what happened? Uh, religious identification rose by a statistically significant amount in that period of time in that one area and not any place else in New Zealand. So actually, the, you know, again, it's, you're right, Olivia, it, it's like designing these things that just doesn't happen, but there is at least one case like that. And uh, the other thing is, if you look at war zones and things like that, and, and, and look, look at the data, we've, we've put some of it in reports over time. I don't think that this is a, uh, I don't think that this, the, the, the existential uh, insecurity theory is anything like a slam dunk. There's a lot of problems with it. Um, but uh, I also don't think that it's uh, a negative view of religion to think that one of the things that religion can do is to help people in hard times. So, you know, it's not a knock on religion to say that religion could actually thrive in hard times. And to get back to what you were talking about, Olivia, and the coverage of the story, it was notable that the early coverage of religion's relationship to the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States was heavily focused on super spreader events. And there was very little coverage about what religion was doing for individuals or larger groups, how religious communities were helping out, um, part of that may be because congregational life was pretty quickly shut down um, uh, in large swaths of the country. But there was, an, there was a kind of untold story there, and it was largely a sort of good news story. Um, and it may be, you know, if you were really kind of whatever, you could make some sort of argument about um, progressive folks don't like to look at religion as a kind of good thing or you know, it's just more natural for them to see the kind of deleterious ways that religion affects our lives and a little harder to see the good things that it does for individuals or societies. I, I don't really know. When it comes to Christian nationalism, I would like to say to, uh, to everybody, um, you know, I think that we should be careful. Um, made the same warning about Islamic terrorism. Um, it, you know, uh, there were people who committed and are, I suppose, still committing terrorism in the name of Islam. Does that make, is it, in, is it inherently Islamic 
Uh, and, and I think with that same skepticism should be brought to the notion of Christian nationalism. That is, as why I said, is there just, are there people who are Christians and people who are nationalists and there's a Venn diagram and some who are both, or is there something inherently nationalistic and in Christian or something Christianity or something inherently Christian in nationalism? I, I just like to see people bring an equal degree I'd like to see progressives bring as much skepticism to the notion that nationalism is inherently Christian or Christianity is inherently nationalist and supremacist as they brought to the notion that terrorism was inherently Islamic or Islam was inherently terrorist. I just think we should be careful about tarring large world religious groups, or even just in the US, large groups with, with such a broad brush and suggesting that there's something about the theology of these groups, uh, as opposed to their politics and their history that makes them, uh, that, that it produces this nexus. I better shut up. Well, religion thrives in a crisis and religion thrives in good times too. It seems like this thing, religion, might be pretty complex and, and not, not fit into boxes that, that we put them into. I want to remind the audience that we have about 12 minutes left. So if you have a question for one of our three esteemed panelists, uh, please do not hesitate to use that Q&A box, and we will try to answer your questions in the order that we get to them. Um, we have a question from uh, the audience who uh, this person asks, what about the representation of religion within the media? We are slowly seeing more reporters who are Muslim, for example. Do you think this has an effect on the news, uh, the audience, what possibly gets covered and how, or is this just window dressing? Uh, if you'll think back um, to earlier in the decade, lots of calls for accountability, diversifying the media. Um, are you seeing that from where you stand? And does it make a difference in how faith is covered? Yeah, I can I can start there. Um, I, I think it does make a difference. We are we are seeing a shift. It's slow, uh, and change is often slow. And if you are going, um, if you're going by percentages um, compared to overall population, you won't be very happy. Uh, but if you're looking at where we started and, and the direction we're going, um, there there might be a little bit more solace there. Um, you know, I, I think it's particularly important. Um, to, to look at this from the lens of, of Muslim representation uh, because of, and you know, there, there are a number of studies you can look at to, to recognize uh, the ways in which Muslims are disproportionately portrayed as inherently violent uh, on, on screen. And ISPU has a fantastic uh, study, recent study, but also more research available if anyone's interested in seeing that. And there are two things that I'm seeing specifically from Muslims entering into uh, media uh, workspaces. Um, the first is um, that they are largely, um, not exclusively, but often being tasked with covering issues around Islam. Um, and so if you look at someone like Aisha Khan at Religion News Service, uh, Ruwayd Abdelaziz at Huffington Post, uh, Hannah Alam when she was at NPR, now at Washington Post, um, Eamon Ismail at, at, Atlanta, or at Slate. Um, so often they're, they're representing these stories. And on the one hand, you might say, well, that's not fair. They shouldn't be put into a box where they have to do that. On the other hand, you might talk to them and say, oh, they're, they're happy to do this because they see this uh, as a way to, uh, to, tip the, to tip the scale a little bit. Uh, and, and address the imbalance. And so uh, we are seeing quite a bit of the, the counter anti-Islamic uh, coverage coming from Muslims themselves. And I don't think it would be happening uh, if we didn't have Muslims in these newsrooms. The second thing, which also doesn't seem entirely fair, um, and it's not, uh, but it's something that's happening and, and is having a positive impact, um, is that having these people in the newsrooms means that their colleagues uh, can go to them with questions. Uh, and you know, that might start initially as a question about language, right? What do we, what do we call this piece of clothing? Um, how do we refer to somebody who belongs to this uh, group in Islam? Um, but then that might turn into, let me, let me run this idea by you and see if it's appropriate. Uh, let me consult. Let me show this piece to you, uh, this clip, and see if you see if you think I did a good job. 
Um, and, and then it might turn into, let, you know, I'm open to story ideas. Let me know if you come across anything interesting. And so that's, that's the way this world works. Um, and it's unfortunate that it's that way, but it, but it is having quite a positive impact that, that you won't necessarily see on your uh, TV screens and be able to point to it and say, I, I, I noticed the difference, uh, but it's something that's happening behind the scenes and, and hopefully it's something that continues to grow. So Myrna, as you continue to speak, uh, you're becoming more and more bathed in light. And <laughs> um, another question. Um, we continue to see reports that there are huge swaths of the US public that report not, quote, having faith in news media or even certain forms of expertise. Um, so um, what can we do about that? trust deficit? What, what are strategies that have worked for you in either um, diagnosing what is the resistance behind the resistant audience? Um, how have you overcome that resistance? Or maybe this is another fake story, like, like Alan was suggesting, and, and people actually are, you know, they say, I don't trust what the news says, but they're reading it anyway, and it's informing their, you know, the, the way that they go about everyday life. And this can be a question for everybody. Uh, but uh, Olivia, why don't you <laughs> start it us off? Okay. Um, I I mean I can't I can't speak to like uh, U.S. Uh, public trust in the media as a general point. I mean I think I can I can speak to trust in information sources. So it's almost become a truism in you know the world that i work in that um you know religious leaders are trusted leaders and people uh, uh, are more likely to get their information from um uh consider the information from these leaders than other sources um and there's and there are various pieces of research various surveys that show that but also show that religious leaders maybe aren't the most trusted um but there is a little bit of this reliance on trust information and religious leaders um, and and it's been the basis of a lot of development programs like trying to do there's been this rush to do health messaging with uh, public health messaging with religious leaders in the pandemic and it's led to kind of a lot of instrumentalizing of of, of leadership um, misunderstanding how um, even if you provide correct information, how it doesn't necessarily cascade through religious hierarchies, how it can get distorted as it cascades, how it can be um, uh, used and misused. And um, this a central idea that we often come back to is that, you know, just having the technical information, um, like the technical health information on its own, isolated on its own, is not going to be sufficient and that you have to meld it with the um you know meld it with a theological understanding a uh you know the personal cultural experiences of wherever that you know whoever you're talking to in whichever context around the world um you know you're wherever you're working in so i think that there's a little bit of a a little bit of a, a truism about the religious leaders trust information piece um and that's not speaking to journalism in the US at all, but that's something that we have picked up on in the last year that's, um, that we need to, you know, certainly in this humanitarian development field need to start countering, um, countering that and explaining, just again, explaining the complexity of that a little bit more, um, you know, how religious leadership is diverse. If you're only talking to a certain group of leaders, you're not going to be communicating to everyone that you actually want to communicate to. That um, health messaging, just a one-off oriented, you know, brief lecture on some public health messages isn't going to change necessarily what comes up in the sermon on Sunday. You know, there's a lot of assumptions going on there um, that have been worrying to witness in the last year. So back to someone that can talk about public uh, trust in the media in the US. 
Well, I, I can do that, be, at least from a factual, because uh, uh, Pew Research Center does a lot of work in this area, and actually, I think, very sophisticated work, and, and I would encourage people to go to the website and, and look at our work on trust, uh, and that's not, uh, I'm not directly involved in it, so it's my colleagues who've done fabulous work in this area. Um, by and large, yeah, trust in the media is low. If you ask people about the media, the media is not held in high repute in the United States. Um, trust in the military is relatively high. Um, uh, trust in scientists uh, probably rose somewhat during the COVID pandemic. Uh, whether it'll last, I don't know or, or not. Um, but generally speaking, the big pattern and the thing, the really important thing, I think, is the trust in government um, uh, has been declining for a long time in the United States and is, and is basically at record lows. Uh, and that's a long term trend. And um, and kind of worrying, uh, worrisome in terms of democracy. Um, I, I can also tell you, you know, what people already know is true. Um, Americans live in very different media universes. Uh, some people are in a CNN universe and some people are in a Fox News universe and they don't trust the other's news. And it really makes a big difference uh, where people get their news from. And uh, when they say they don't trust the media, that doesn't mean that in fact they, they aren't uh, watching a particular set of cable uh, news and actually uh, believing it or following certain things on social media and, and believing it. And last point that I'll make, because uh, I think it's actually what I learned from some of our research about trust that was interesting to me and that I might not have known otherwise, is that trust is a good. Um, it's a good in, in the sense that it is positively associated with a lot of, um, of good things in society. Um, for individuals, um, but by the same the same token, it's unequally distributed in our society in much the way that other goods are unequally distributed. That is, people with higher levels of education, higher incomes, um, better health, and better situations tend to have more trust, more social trust, and more trust in institutions than those uh, who get the short end of the stick, um, uh, one way or the other, in our society. And that's important to realize. In that sense, um, trust is is both a cause and an effect. Uh, people who uh, are on the outs in one way or another tend not to trust. Uh, and in that sense, trust isn't inherently the right thing to do. Maybe it's right for people uh, who, uh, who are left out in society not to trust institutions. And in fact, people, again, who kind of get the short stick in society have less trust of institutions. And uh, again, since I, I suspect that a lot of the audience for this is progressive, um, I think that that's an important thing for progressives to, to know and, and factor in. Thank you. I want to thank all our panelists for, for joining us today and, and making time um, in their busy, busy schedules to come, come speak with us about Faith in the Story. This is Alex Shu from the Ansari Institute um, saying thank you for, for watching us today and uh, have a great evening. <laughs>